Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's event. Uh, my name is Nick Pierce. I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath, and I'm delighted this afternoon that we're able to welcome uh, to our series of public events, uh, Polycrisis, the series that we've been running this year, uh, Professor Barry Eichengreen. Um, Barry will need, I think, very little introduction to you all, uh, world-renowned economic historian, um, in particular of the international monetary system, uh, his books Globalizing Capital uh, on the international monetary system in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, Golden Fetters, his you know, incredibly important work on the gold standard and the Great Depression, and more recent works looked at uh, uh, the European Union, the development of monetary union in the European Union, the financial crisis, and other works. Um, and today, Professor Eichen Green is here to speak to us uh, about his new book, new co-authored book, In Defense of Public Debt, uh, published a couple of years ago with uh, Oxford University Press. And uh, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, obviously we've seen a you know, big increase and in following, of course, from the uh, global financial crisis in uh, 2008, uh, a, a big increase in public debt in order to deal with the crisis. In the UK, we had a uh, a furlough scheme for keeping people in work, other major interventions in the economy during the COVID pandemic, which did lead to a further increase in our public debt. And in defense of public debt, the book that uh, Professor Eichen Green is going to talk about addresses this question of, you know, are we placing a drag on economic growth? Are we burdening future generations, as is often said, with these high levels of public debt? Um, I'm not going to say any more about that because Professor Eichen Green will be able to talk you through uh, the argument of the book. Um, there's be, there'll be an opportunity when he's finished speaking to um, uh, to ask questions. Um, in terms of housekeeping, I should say to everybody on the uh, call in the event that your cameras and microphones uh, will remain switched off. And if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A function, in the Q&A chat, and then I can group those questions and put them to Professor Eichen Green uh, at the end of uh, his presentation. We are recording the session and we'll make it available online as a podcast and a video which you'll be able to find uh, on our website. Um, so you can catch up with it again in the, in, in the future. But thank you very much for joining us today. And I'd like to now hand over, welcome Professor Eichen Green. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Eichen Green. I'm gonna ask you to now give your presentation on your book. Thank you. Nick, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, this book, In Defense of Public Debt, uh, went off to the publisher a little over two years ago. So I'm going to uh, take this opportunity to uh, review some of the arguments of the book, of course, but also to um, update my views, mark my views to market, if you will, because there has been uh, additional water under the bridge, as it were, in the last two years. There has been additional public debt issuance and new worries about debt sustainability in the United States uh, and in a variety of other places. Um, let me uh, reiterate that the book is co-authored with Asma El Ganeni, Rui Estevez, and Chris Michener, who you see here on the left. From where I sit in the United States, uh, public debt is very much in the news, although the news is mixed. There are, are, are different views of the problem and even uh, of the question of whether, whether there is a problem. So there's a popular narrative that sounds the alarm over the fact that national debt has hit $30 trillion uh, in the United States and that there could be an impact, whatever that means, on Americans. There, there is worry about ill-defined worry about the level of public debt. But there is also this view, although a lot of public debt has been accumulated and the national debt in the United States now has topped $30 trillion, some economists contend that the nation's large debt load is not unhealthy, given that the economy is growing, interest rates remain relatively low, investors are still willing to buy U.S. Treasury securities, which are an important source of safe assets to uh, to the financial system. Um, on the other hand, if I'm allowed three hands, there is also this, uh, the possibility of a debt ceiling crisis growing closer. 
So if you're not an aficionado uh, of U.S. financial history, you may not know that the U.S. debt ceiling uh, originated during World War I, when Congress, which had previously been able to approve or veto every single security issuance by the federal government, turned that right over to the U.S. Treasury, given wartime uh, imperatives, but imposed a ceiling on how much debt the Treasury could issue, and that ceiling was again breached toward the beginning of this year. Uh, the Treasury is currently looking for pennies under, under the living room couch to pay the bills, and those reserves will be exhausted in, in coming months with uh, uncertain consequences to which we can return. So uh, today I'm going to um, uh, return to the debate in the United States and, and the nature of the debt ceiling problem here because it's timely. And I'm going to focus on, on the U.S. case because it is one that I know. But I think it's appropriate to start with Europe for, for uh, reasons that will become uh, uh, apparent in as early as my next slide. And it's appropriate to start with some monetary and financial history. Why Europe? Uh, early pub public debt history is disproportionately European history. Uh, public debt issuance and the institutions surrounding the issuance of public debt uh, were distinctively European because war was especially prevalent in Europe over uh, a millennium, over, over the centuries. Uh, for the longest time, uh, here in this map, I look back to Europe's uh, political geography circa 1200. The European continent was divided into hundreds, literally of uh, princely kingdoms, uh, uh, sovereign city-states, and, and, and the like, some with very modest hinterlands. Uh, the uh, eminent political sociologist Charles Tilley emphasized how uh, the average state uh, in Europe was small and that that political geography reflected Europe's physical geography as a land landmass divided by multiple mountain ranges and river valleys that posed natural obstacles to the formation of more extensive territorial states and other scholars like the uh, uh, historical anthropologist Jared Diamond have, have similarly characterized European history with all these sovereign states butted up against one another. Border conflicts uh, uh, were rife and European states had to borrow in order to finance the national defense and meet those uh, political and, 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 and military emergencies. Contrast China, much of with, which is a great plain, which has lent itself over the millennia to the formation of unitary um, uh, uh, imperial states uh, as early in the Chinese case as 221 BC. Uh, uh, physical geography that lent itself similarly to a uniform written language, a standardized currency, a unitary tax system, a strong central government uh, with the capacity to build a great wall to keep out first Mongol invaders and then Russian invaders from the north to construct great hydraulic projects like the Grand Canal because of, uh, of this physical, unique phys physical geography, or at least uh, very different physical geography from the European, uh, uh, China had a different political geography and it lacked the need to borrow to finance offense and defensive wars, offensive and defensive wars in the same way as Europe. So uh, Public debt and a public debt architecture really only emerges in China at the end of the 19th century, literally uh, many centuries after we already see the development of, of that public debt architecture in Europe. 
Um, from, from the very start, though, European sovereigns faced uh, commitment problems. The king or the sovereign was the supreme earthly power. He or she was the embodiment of the state, as Louis XIV famously reminded his subjects. The unlimited, unchecked power of the sovereign limited his ability to borrow because there was nothing or no one to prevent him from reneging on uh, his obligations. So it followed that sovereigns could borrow only for relatively short terms and at high interest rates, uh, first from their bankers, typically Italian bankers, and then from their publics. So uh, in or order to enhance that uh, ability to borrow and solve that commitment problem, certain political institutions had to be put in place. Sovereign debt began to rise toward modern levels only with the creation of representative assemblies in which the creditors sat, in which they were empowered to oversee tax collection, uh, improve increases in, in, in spending, and authorize debt issuance. So you see the uh, creation of those representative Republican assemblies in Italian city-states like Florence, Genoa, Venice. You see them then uh, uh, in uh, the Netherlands and in England, of course, with its glorious revolution with the creation of a parliament with the ability to uh, check and balance arbitrary action by the sovereign. And with the creation of, uh, of those political institutions, the ability uh, of the state to borrow is enhanced. Real interest rates on sovereign debt begin to come down as sovereign debt uh, comes to be recognized as an obligation of the state rather than a personal obligation of the individual occupying the throne. So here on the right from the book, uh, I show you the trend decline in uh, long-term borrowing costs, real long-term borrowing co costs in Holland over the period when the Estates General, the Representative Republican Assembly is created. And, 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 and you can see the dramatic fall in real borrowing costs facing the Dutch over, uh, over that period. Um, over time, the uses uh, to which public debt has been put have evolved. So financing wars has always been of premier importance. I show you uh, the US example on the right with the debt public debt to GDP ratio on the vertical axis. And you can see how the rise of public debt has been punctuated by these successive wars, by the War of 1812, our Civil War, World War I, uh, the Great Depression. Uh, public debt has been incurred over the centuries to meet public health emergencies, not only COVID-19, but uh, the plague in the case uh, of Siena and Venice in the 14th century. Starting in the 19th century, governments also borrowed to invest in, in, in productive infrastructure, which uh, ha had the um, uh, purpose of uh, strengthening uh, ability to export, to produce, to trade, to grow. So we're talking about roads, railways, ports, urban lighting, and sewers. Modern economic growth, industrialization being also a process of urbanization. Uh, these investments then have been important over the last couple of centuries uh, to the process of modern economic growth. And uh, we it's also relevant to observe that the Dutch public debt pioneers have borrowed periodically to finance investments in climate change abatement to build dikes and so forth to prevent their productive lands from being flooded by high tides. Um, so responsible states have borrowed over the centuries to meet emergencies, be those uh, uh, national defense, military emergencies, uh, public health emergencies, climate 
related emergencies. But uh, responsible states have also reduced that debt load relative to GDP, relative to their, the size of their economies once the immediate uh, emergency has passed. Um, we have learned over the years and been, been reminded in the last decade and a half that uh, there always tends to be another emergency, another novel coronavirus, another financial crisis, financial crises being other uh, emergencies in response to which responsible states borrow another climate disaster, another adverse geopolitical event. And, and, and you can see in the U.S. case how the federal government has succeeded in the past in reducing uh, those high public debts incurred during emergencies. So I think prudent governments need to at least start thinking now about how to uh, restore that capacity to borrow now that hopefully uh, um, the public health emergency, Europe's energy-related emergency have passed. They need to uh, think about the feasibility uh, uh, of reducing those high public debts and restoring their ability to borrow. So in the book, we look at this process. We look at a number of historic public debt consolidated consolidation episodes, and we uh, engage in the standard uh, public debt arithmetic. We ask, uh, what are the immediate determinants of, of, of changes in the debt to GDP ratio? So delta, of course, means change in uh, the debt to, to GDP ratio on the left-hand side of this accounting relationship. And that change depends on whether the government is running deficits or surpluses, where primary deficit or surpluses means putting debt service payments aside, including them instead in the second term. So D is the primary deficit as a share of GDP. Um, R and G are respectively the real interest rate on the debt and the growth rate of the economy, respectively. And that difference needs to be interacted with the inherited debt, the lagged debt to GDP ratio, where interest payments on the lagged debt will raise the amount of debt that the government has to issue other things equal, but the growth of the economy, G, will grow the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio, uh, which is helpful for bringing uh, indebtedness relative to the size of the economy down and the stock flow adjustment is everything else needed to make the two sides of the equation add up, like uh, emergency bailouts of banks, debt conversions, debt defaults, so forth, and so on. So we put this equation to work for a number of, uh, of historical cases. Let me uh, walk you three, through briefly three historical cases that I think highlight the difference between uh, past episodes when high debts were successfully brought down and today. So the first historical case we look at in the book is Britain after the French and Napoleonic Wars. And it's useful uh, to remind ourselves that the debt to GDP ratio in, 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 in Britain circa 1820 was twice what it is in the UK today on the order of 200% of GDP. And that was brought down to a mere 20% of GDP over the subsequent century by the eve of World War I. And that was done entirely by running budget surpluses, running primary budget surpluses, year after year after year for fully 90 years, with the exception only of like 1902, when the Boer War needed to be financed. So what made this possible? a uh, uh, Victorian philosophy of sound finance, where to Peel and Gladstone and others, sound finance meant uh, budget surpluses, low taxes, limited government, all in the service of growing the economy, but also restoring the ability to borrow in the event of a future conflict with France, with Germany, with someone. 
and the political constellation uh, of the time. Even after three reform acts in the 19th century, only men with limited amounts of property uh, could vote and effectively had representation in parliament. So it was the creditors who made parliamentary policy and favored this policy of running budget surpluses in order to faithfully service and pay off the debt. Another uh, case would be the United States uh, after our civil war, where again, we effectively retired the debt, extinguished the public debt over half a century by running primary budget surpluses year after year after year uh, with no exception. What made this possible? Again, strong creditor influence in politics as reflected in our decision to return to the gold standard in 1873. The populists were not happy about this strong creditor influence, but it was a political fact of life. Uh, representatives of the Southern states were opposed to expansive federal spending because it would have undermined uh, the prevailing social order, meaning white control after reconstruction in the South. There was very limited need for military spending in the United States prior to the Spanish-American War uh, after the turn of the century. Growth and immigration are widely seen as the story of how we in the United States grew out from under our debt. And that story is wrong. We grew out from under our debt by running budget surpluses and retiring it. And a third similar case would be France, which came out of the Franco-Prussian War in 1871 with a debt to GDP ratio approaching 100%. Uh, similar to the UK and the European average. Today, they paid off that debt by running budget surpluses for a couple of successive decades uh, because the elites saw new taxes as a necessary evil, enabling the country to prepare for another impending German war, which after the Mor Moroccan case, after the turn of Moroccan crisis, after the turn of, of the century, they could see clearly as coming. French taxes were also regressive in their incidence. They were mainly consumption taxes, which fell on the working class, something that the elites in parliament uh, did not oppose. So in, in the book, we use that, uh, we, we look at these three episodes where, as you can see above the first blue, arrow, there were these very marked declines in the debt to GDP ratio over the period in, in question, achieved more than completely, as you can see above the second blue arrow, by running primary budget surpluses year after year after year. The interest rate growth rate differential contributed nothing to deficit retirement over the period. It, in fact, contributed negatively, modestly so in the US and France, more dramatically so in Britain, which was a relatively slow growing economy over the course of the long 19th century. And you can see one more interesting factoid in this table. That's Chancellor Goshen's 1888 debt conversion, where he bought back debt that was trading above par. He bought it back at par as provided for by the, um, the contracts underlying the debt, saving the British taxpayer 25% of, uh, of GDP. Quite uh, an extraordinary financial engineering achievement. So in, in the book, we also analyze other cases like Germany after World War I that we would not want to emulate, where a debt of 100% of GDP was wiped out by hyperinflation. That's not an experience we would want to uh, emulate. It led to, uh, resulted in, in quite high borrowing costs for the German uh, uh, Reich in, in the Weimar period and debt that began to rise again thereafter. It led to political polarization. It's too strong to say it led to the rise of Hitler, but it was not helpful 
from uh, the point of view of political solidarity and 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 political consolidation. Um, we look at uh, European and U.S. experience, advanced country experience after World War II, when high debts were brought down over the course of the third quarter of the 20th century. The circle on the left shows you how dramatically they were brought down from 112% of GDP to only 26% of GDP over the period. Um, it is widely argued that uh, a combination of rapid growth and financial repression, uh, interest rates that were, were capped by regulation were responsible for this. And indeed, they played the largest role, but they were not the entire story. Uh, primary budget surpluses run year after year after year by a wide variety of countries, as shown you by the second circle to the right, also played an important role. So you can you, you now know the uh, not very hidden subtext uh, of this part of the talk. Do you think that our political systems are able to run primary budget surpluses year after year after year for an extended period? Given the demands that are currently being placed on our states and given the political polarization from which many of our countries suffer. Um, my one, uh, another one of my co authors, Ugo Panitza, and I looked in this article at uh, how many countries have been able to run large primary budget surpluses larger than 5% of GDP year after year after year in the modern period. And we found only three uh, countries facing special circumstances. Norway, after 1999, after it discovered large amounts of oil and ga gas in the North Sea that it wanted to sock away for future generations. So it ran budget surpluses and invested the surplus in its sovereign wealth fund. Belgium, after 1995, when Belgium being a founding member of the European Economic Community, but a country with a large debt was desperate to uh, satisfy the Maastricht convergence criteria and get into the Euro area. And Singapore, after 1990, Singapore is in a somewhat dicey part of the world geopolitically, not always on good terms historically with its neighbor to the north. Malaysia has an exceptionally volatile economy due to the volatility of entrepot trade and pharmaceutical manufacturing and so forth. And it has an impeccably strong technocratic government. So these three countries were able to run budget surpluses of 5% of GDP successively for periods as long as 10 years, but it's hard to point to to name many others. What about faster growth as a way to grow out of uh, our current um, debt loads? Growing the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio is the painless way of growing our economies. Problem being that the experts who worry about these things, the International Monetary Fund, for example, see slower growth in the advanced countries and worldwide over the next five to 10 years rather than faster growth. Could be that new general purpose technologies like artificial intelligence, chat GPT, and all that will uh, change this and that we will, we are about to embark on a period of faster growth. But that word about is an important caveat here. If you look at earlier general purpose technologies like the steam engine and the internal combustion engine, and the personal computer, you observe that it takes quite a while for companies and individuals to adapt their practices so as to capitalize on these new GPTs. It takes quite a while for them to translate into faster growth. That was true of the steam engine. It took a couple of de decades. It was too true of the internal combustion engine. It took a couple of decades. It was true of the personal computer. Uh, I got my first one in 19, 1981, but the period of, of, of faster uh, growth fueled by IT only started after 1990 
five. So I'm not confident that AI will translate into faster growth anytime soon. What about uh, inflating away the debt? Uh, we actually have seen some inflating away of the debt in the last couple of years, but now we're seeing uh, in, uh, interest rates and debt maturities adjusting to that. So this is helpful fr from a short-term point of view, but I think the short-term is now pretty much over, over and we will be reminded that uh, uh, inflation is a double-edged sword from this point of view. View. Actually, I show you here for the world as a whole, the black line is the debt to GDP ratio uh, uh, shown as scaled on the left of this diagram. And you can see worldwide how the debt to GDP ratio has risen steadily since the global financial crisis around 2008, how it rose even more dramatically in the pandemic and how it's now fallen uh, due to inflation and uh, why I think that uh, that fall is unlikely to continue. So um, one, of, one of my co-authors on the book, Rui Estevez, and I looked at uh, inflation and debt consolidation over the last 200 years, and we found lots of periods where inflation was helpful uh, in the very short term, surprise inflation, like we had in 2022, uh, has been successful in a variety of cases in, in uh, at least modestly reducing elevated debt to GDP ratios, but any such contribution goes away pretty quickly thereafter. Um, so let me return to uh, the debt problem in the United States and ask how serious uh, is, is the problem here? So we have a political problem, obviously, in getting the Republicans and the Democrats in the Congress to agree on raising the debt ceiling. And I, I, I think it would be, will be very disruptive to the US economy and the global financial system if we don't get that agreement, which I fear not getting it as a real possibility. That's the political problem. But is there an economic problem as well. So in the United States, debt in the hands of the public as a share of GDP is now 100% matching its peak after World War II. And our uh, Congressional Budget Office, uh, our equivalent of the Office of Budget, Budget Responsibility in the UK, projects that on unchanged law, uh, the debt to GDP ratio will continue rising. Um, from 100% now to maybe 108, 109% in 10 years. And then further out into the future, we have an even bigger problem, unfunded social security promises and the like. Those projections to repeat are based on unchanged law and law can change. We can decide to raise taxes in the US. Uh, we're still a relatively lightly taxed country by advanced country standards, or if the Republicans had their way, we could decide to cut various forms of government expenditure. Even if law remains unchanged, how serious a problem do we have? Well, we can return to that uh, debt accounting equation that I showed you before. Um, Debt to GDP is 100% uh, in the United States. Debt in the hands of the public is 100% in the United States. And this equation is a reminder that if the interest rate on the debt R is lower than the growth rate of the economy G, that the debt ratio will fall. The denominator will grow faster than the numerator, even if nothing else changes. The government can continue running at least modest deficits without further elevating the debt to GDP ratio, so long as it remains the case, so long as it is an important qualifier, so long as it remains the case that R minus G uh, is negative. So what is the current state of affairs 
R minus T has been negative for the better part of two decades. Right now, 10-year Treasury bonds in the United States yield 3.6%. I looked yesterday morning. The CBO's forecast for inflation over the next 10 years is 2.4%. So R in the United States, the real interest rate is 1.2%. That's up. That's considerably higher than before the pandemic and the subsequent inflation. The CBO growth forecast for the next 10 years is 1.7% per annum, real. So R minus G is still forecast to be negative over the next 10 years, negative one half of 1%. So that means that the debt to GDP ratio will come down even if we in the United States continue to run modest budget deficits, more modest than at, at the moment, of course. The primary budget deficit as a share of GDP right now circa uh, in 2023 is forecast at 2.7%, not 0.5%. So some deficit reduction is indeed needed in the United States to stabilize the, the debt ratio. And even more uh, deficit reduction would be needed in order to bring it down. The um, big question, of course, maybe the $30 trillion question is whether interest rates will stay low. That's what financial markets are currently betting. As I, as I told you before, uh, the Congressional Budget Office uh, is forecasting inflation at 2.4%, inflation index treasury bonds forecasted at 2.3%. Uh, if interest rates return, real interest rates, return to 0.5%, which is where they were before the pandemic, and the US economy grows by 1.7% as the CBO forecasts, then the US can run primary budget deficits of 1.2% of GDP. So again, this indicates that uh, we have to engage in at least a modest amount of fiscal consolidation, given that we're running a primary budget uh, deficit of 2.7% of GDP uh, at the moment, some fiscal adjustment is required. Will real interest rates remain lower than real growth rates? That's the debate over secular stagnation. Some people say that the weak investment and the global savings glut that characterized the pre-pandemic period will return real interest rates uh, because investment is weak and savings is strong, uh, will translate into renewed low interest rates. I show you the logic for that using the standard savings investment diagram on the right. Other people will argue that we're in a brave new world with more public debt, meaning higher real interest rates. So um, savings depend on a lot of things. They depend on demographics. As we all live longer, longevity increases almost everywhere, but in, in the US, people save more for longer retirements. Um, China and other emerging markets that are high savers may be growing more slowly going forward, which means somewhat less savings from them. My guess would be that these two factors, uh, uh, longevity and slower Chinese growth, will more or less cancel out on the savings side. And on, on the investment side, uh, there is political pressure to update infrastructure, to electrify more rail lines in the UK, like the one you have between London and, and, and Bath. Uh, to engage in climate change abatement related investments to enhance, uh, to invest in, in the National Health Service to exploit new digital uh, technologies. Uh, those pressures for investment will put upward pressure on real interest rates. But I think I would argue that those same investments, if done intelligently, will boost the rate of growth of the UK economy 
faster growth will make available more savings, will make debt sustainability less of a problem. And again, my guess is that these two offsetting factors will be awash. So the bottom line there is that I do think that uh, the low level of real interest rates will return post uh, pandemic and uh, post burst of inflation, that uh, this will require our economies in the US and the UK to engage in some modest debt consolidation to prevent their debt ratios from rising or um, bring those debt ratios down progressively over time. Uh, debt ratios are only gonna, gonna decline slowly because of political constraints. Uh, we will be in this battle with uh, high public debts, therefore for an extended period going forward. So I, I try to be optimistic about these matters to avoid uh, public debt uh, um, alarmism, but I do think we have a problem to address and I wonder whether we have the collectively the political solidarity and wherewithal to do so um, constructively. So I uh, look forward to the discussion part of our uh, hour. Thank you for listening to me. Very many thanks in the Professor Eichen Green. Fascinating presentation. Um, uh, lots to, to discuss there. Um, I, I'm going to open up the Q&A and um, there's a, there's a couple of questions there first, which I wanted to ask myself, which is um, uh, you talked about the relationship between debt and inflation and the fact that a, a, a short in the short term, at least a post debt increase accompanied by surprise inflation can give you some short term benefits, but it doesn't last. Um, and the question is just what the evidence is on the relationship between episodes of increases in debt, war, financial crisis, COVID more recently, and inflation. Should we have expected an inflation surge after COVID, or is it uh, is it not always the case that there's this relationship between uh, high levels of issuance of public debt and inflation? So, first question, and then the one related to that, I, I think as well, which is um, monetary policy and um, public debt. And in particular, I just wanted to ask about the relationship between the unwinding of quantitative easing. Uh, and what we can expect, particularly in the current period. And um, as you will know, you know, we had this episode last year with the short lived trust government, um, you know, announcing big tax cuts, particularly for the rich, uh, saying that would stimulate growth at the same time as the Bank of England uh, was unwinding QE and the confluence of these factors producing this run on pension funds, Bank of England having to step back into the market and so on. And I just wonder what in, in your in your sort of prognosis for the coming period, what this sort of interrelationship between um, uh, unwinding QE and, and, and the Fed and the Bank of England increasing their interest rates, is it just all in one direction? Uh, or do we have to think differently about this? I think we've got something like 875 billion of sterling in quantitative easing of the Bank of England from the financial crisis and COVID. So that was sort of second question, if, if we could there, Professor Eichengreen. Yeah, so those are, 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 are great questions both on uh, historical periods uh, of large public debt and inflation. I would recommend again that paper with Rui Estevez up and away on the relationship between the two. It's it's in Oxford Open Economics, ungated, so uh, right. available to, right. to all. And the answer is that high public debts are, are not always followed by bursts of inflation. So the, I showed you three historical cases in my talk. In none of those historical cases were uh, very heavy public debts inflated away or followed by even uh, short periods of peacetime inflation. There are plenty plenty of uh, e examples where inflation did come into play <clears throat> at the same time. Um, why, why did we experience this COVID era, post-COVID, we, we prefer to think about it, burst of inflation? Was that a corollary of high public debts? Was that part of an effort on the part of governments and central banks to bring those high public debts down? I think the answer is no, that mm. we experienced a burst of inflation for a 
combination of demand side factors uh, like uh, the Biden administration's excessive 2021 fiscal stimulus. So I think uh, the US federal government response to COVID fiscally was generally good with that one big exception, which was generally bad. <laughs> and supply side problems, um, shortages, um, supply chain disruptions and so forth, which made uh, motor vehicles exceptionally expensive. Uh, other other examples could be given. So uh, I think our COVID, post-COVID inflation was a bit idiosyncratic from, from this mm -hmm. point of view. Um, cases like um, Germany in the 1920s, uh, there was not, not only conflict within Germany about who should uh, service and pay the taxes for this public debt. But there was also conflict between uh, the Germans and the French, the Germans and the Belgians over reparations. And high inflation was a way for Germany to demonstrate, in quotes, that it couldn't pay reparations. So again, it's an idiosyncratic situation, in my view, rather than one fundamentally related to uh, domestic debt of the government. Uh, certainly, so so when I talk about debt in the hands of the public, that includes debt held by the central bank. So it's still on the books. Yeah. And if you know, big big investors are are actively selling off their holdings, someone else has to buy them, and will presumably demand compensation, more compensation in order to hold more. So um, quantitative tightening does generally have the the effect of of putting some upward pre pressure on market interest rates and the alternative to that is the central bank uh taking capital losses on it its residual holdings so central banks in their wisdom do a little bit of both you know they don't uh actively sell into the market very much very often, and they rely mainly on letting maturing holdings of public debt roll off their books when they mm. mature so that the impact on market interest rates is not that great. But we're also seeing central banks taking losses. You know, um, in, in, in my view, not a big deal because, you know, once the debts uh, mature, the losses go away. If you're a Silicon Valley bank, you're open to a run by mm. your um creditors if you're the bank of england you're not to, to put it in very blunt terms so i i i think uh, the bank of england can sit tight as uh public debt with an average maturity of seven years in the uk gradually rolls off its books yeah 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 um i've, I've got a couple of questions which i, I want to come to but I, I wanted just to ask you about the the sort of political economic conditions of the current conjuncture, because obviously you're, you know, you're, you're, you're famous uh, for your, for your work on the gold standard for saying that the gold standard couldn't be reintroduced or uh, after world war one in the 1920s, because the political economic conditions had changed, you know, the working class had arrived in the electorate. It had its demands. It wasn't prepared to accept the uh, lack of attention um, to its needs, mass unemployment, et cetera, as it had in the 19th century, the long depression, of the 1870s and so on. Um, what are the kind of what are the, what's the sort of contemporary political economic conditions that may configure what can happen in a country like the US or the UK in similar terms? I mean, is it is it particularly the countries where the trade union movement has been substantially weakened, where working class influence in politics may you know deem to be far less um, powerful than once it was? I mean, what 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 are the constraints on policymakers that might be analogous to those that existed in the nineteen twenties and thirties? We find in the book that um, uh, encompassing coalition governments uh, with representation of both the left and the right, if you will, are best able to stay the course in right. terms of, of running stable policies over time, uh, growing out from under debt loads and, and running budget surpluses or, or, or balanced budgets. Uh, if you will, and that where you have high levels of, of, of political polarization, when 
the left is in power, it wants to spend on its preferred programs because it knows when the right takes over, it uh, that spending is going to go away. Uh, the right, when it's in power, wants to cut taxes in order to starve the beast and mm. prevent the left from being able to spend when uh, it comes into office. So I worry that political polarization in particular is uh, an obstacle to uh, constructive discussion and action in the political sphere to consolidate our um, our heavy debts. I kind of think that uh, first past the post political systems like uh, you have in the UK and we have in the US are don't lend themselves to uh, forming those encompassing coalition governments in the same way as proportional representation with threshold systems on the European continent or two round electoral systems. These things are no no guarantee mm -hmm. against uh, uh, governments on the far left or the far right acquiring power. Last time around, the uh, the two round presidential election in France ended up delivering a, a, a centrist pre president, but we know there's far from any guarantee that things will turn out that way in the next French mm -hmm. election. But I, I do think some political environments and political systems, electoral systems are more conducive to stable encompassing governments that can follow consistent policies over time than others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we a couple of questions. What one from uh, my colleague Joe Chris, which is um, d how far do you agree with the with the case that the, the rapid and excessive or apparently excessive fiscal consolidation in the eurozone and the UK contributed to, to otherwise higher levels of debt than might have been expected if fiscal consolidation had been slowed, done on a more measured path, um, and uh, and in, to that degree, how far is more rapid fiscal consolidation? Uh, self-defeating uh, post-crises. Yeah, so rapid fiscal consolidation that gets in the way of economic growth can certainly be self-defeating. That's why I, 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 I think that it makes more sense to put in place uh, um, uh, fiscal consolidation trajectory that um, takes a longer Horizon. I, I, I do think that uh, austerity, to give it a name, was excessive and from the point of view uh, of growth and even debt consolidation counterproductive uh, after 2009 in Europe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, do, I, and I presume from that also from your earlier works that you would agree that the, the response in the coronavirus crisis from the, in the Eurozone that... Uh, uh, you know, the issuance of a common, or at least in part, a common European debt um, and uh, a much more, uh, you know, proactive fiscal policy for investment uh, it, it, across the Eurozone. It was it was a better path than the one followed after 2010 in in the Eurozone crisis then. Yeah, so there, there are chapters in the book, both on uh, austerity after the global financial crisis mm. and on uh, the first year plus uh, the book went off to the publisher in March of 2021, the first year mm -hmm. of COVID. Uh, some of my other work, I have a book called Hall of Mirrors, is uh, partly about how po policymakers and governments learn. And I think uh, they did take constructive lessons from missteps following the global financial crisis, wanted to respond fiscally more quickly and and and, and more aggressively and then be patient about unwinding that mm. uh that that response once the immediate crisis passed again i think um uh the biden administration in 2021 overdid it and there was a you know also a tendency in a way to draw the wrong lesson or draw only a partial lesson that the problem after 2008 was insufficient demand so that in in the COVID crisis, we needed to do everything possible to pump up demand, where mm -hmm. in COVID, there was also a supply chain supply side problem. And we did excessive demand stimulus and suffered the current inflation as yeah. 
results. So there were both appropriate and less appropriate lessons drawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from uh, I, just a cut, there's a question here about about taxes, which I th I think pertains to the UK, because obviously, uh, you know, in the UK we've been through a period of um, well unprecedented productivity stagnation in in the UK since the financial crisis and very you know limited growth. Uh, with, uh, sterling has lost value, particularly after the Brexit referendum. Sterling lost value. Uh, we are in, in an, uh, an open economy, um, and uh, one argument is that we're having to increase taxes to sustain a level of public services that uh, we wish to have. But in the context of very weak growth and limited productivity, um, uh, the, you know th th those taxes are just sort of paying to keep us going. Uh, we're not improving our public services, and we're not doing much to contribute to a reduction in in public debt. Um, and I wonder what you might what, what you might say specifically. Obviously, you, you addressed yourself very much to the to the UK, US context, which is globally the most important. But sitting here in the UK, what do you make of our current economic circumstances and our particular challenges? I, I very much like the way you frame the question, Nick. Um, because uh, we all get asked uh, regularly about the impact of Brexit. And I think uh, the UK pro economic problem is longer lived mm -hmm. than that. I don't, you know, different people will go back a decade and a half or a century and a half, but it's clear that there has been a productivity problem and a growth problem in the UK since 2008 or so. There was a break in the trend at that point and the economy has underperformed, which means, among other things, the government can provide fewer public services, lower, fewer high quality public services than otherwise. Uh, so the, you know, the critical task is to grow the economy and, 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 and address that productivity problem. My view is making it harder for British companies to export to the European continent is part of the problem rather than part of the Solution. solution that a free trade agreement with uh, Singapore is not going to solve that problem. But it's not fundamentally about Brexit, in my view. It's uh, fundamentally about, um, well, it's about Brexit insofar as, as uncertainty that depresses investment yeah. needs to be reduced. And hopefully now uh, uncertainty about what the post-Brexit regime is going to be is behind you. And beyond that, it's about uh, high quality management, investment in education and training, a problem that was decades or, or centuries in the making is not going to be solved in, in a year. So um, I, 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 I think um, given the expectations of Britain's residents, uh, the government is going to have to raise more taxes. It's going to have to figure out how to deliver public services more efficiently but the true fundamental is growing the economy more successfully yeah yeah so a, a, a patient but hard road ahead for the british economy i think is probably the, the the morale of the story for us um well we're coming up to the end of um of the hour and um so i, I want to say very, very big thank you professor eichen green for for giving us um the benefit of, of this talk this evening wonderful uh, fascinating wide-ranging lecture and thank you very much for answering all those questions so uh, comprehensively um, and on behalf of the IPPR I'd like to thank you very much indeed as I mentioned at the beginning to our audience um, the audio and video recordings will be made available uh, soon and if you want to listen to any previous events or find out about our upcoming events uh, in our in our series please do uh, visit our website and uh, I'll just do a little advertorial in closing which is to say that the next online event will be on the 14th of May when we will host data journalist Meredith Broussard for a discussion of her new book on AI and tech so please do join us for that but can I ask you all to uh, sitting at home or wherever you are metaphorically or otherwise to thank Professor Eichen Green for his contribution this evening for sparing the time to talk to us all the way from California about um about his book thank you so much indeed thank you <laughs>